Please put your hands together and welcome Damien. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks very much for joining today at this stem cell research forum. Uh, I'm very pleased to see a full room, and I'm very happy that everyone is here with some interest on stem cells for the eye. I just have to put to let you know that normally my boss, associate professor Alice Pivet, is the one that hosts the event, but unfortunately she's on duties uh, outside Victoria, uh, so she's been traveling all this week and she couldn't come. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to host all of you. We have very interesting speakers today. We have three, three great speakers um, of stem cell uh, researchers, clinicians, talking about the advancing research and applications. Um, so our first speaker will be Grace, uh, Dr. Grace Littlewood. Grace, Dr. Grace Littlewood uh, is from the University of Melbourne, and she graduated in 2010 with a Bachelor of Science. In 2011, she undertook honors year at the Peter Mac McCallum Cancer Institute before making the transition to the neuroscience in a year later. She recently graduated from her PhD with Associate Professor Alice Pivet in the Neurogeneration Group at Centre of Eye Research Australia. Her current research focuses on improving current stem cell models of neurodegenerative disease, including macular degeneration and Alzheimer's disease. Please give a welcome to the Dr. Grace. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about how we use stem cells to understand diseases that cause blindness. So our mission at the Centre for Eye Research Australia is to eliminate the major eye diseases that cause uh, vision loss and blindness and to reduce their impact <coughs> on the community. And the current impact on the Australian community is, is quite large. Um, this study that was conducted in 2009 found that more than 570,000 Australians over the age of 40 um, are afflicted by blindness. And we can see here that the major cause of blindness in the Australian population is age-related macular degeneration and also uh, glaucoma and cataracts, and 23% uh, of other diseases are forming that, um, that final number. Uh, so the burden is quite large, and this encourages us to um, push ourselves and to try and develop better um, methods of researching these diseases. And in the neuroregeneration group, our work is concerned with developing better cellular models. So I guess a good place to start is what, is, what exactly is a cell? So our cells are the building blocks that make us human and make us functioning human beings. Inside every cell in our body is our DNA, which is our genetic material, and that DNA is unique to each one of you. In every single cell in your body, you have the exact same DNA. And your cells then form networks of cells, and this becomes what's known as a tissue, and tissues then form networks with each other to form organs, and this then forms our systems, so our nervous system, our digestive system, and this enables us to function as a human. So what are pluripotent stem cells? Well, pluripotency means uh, the ability to give rise to any cell type in the human body. <coughs> so a pluripotent stem cell is a cell that can not only self-renew, which means when it divides, it creates an exact copy of itself, but it can also, under the right circumstances, give rise to any cell type in the body, meaning it, it can become any cell type in the human body. In an adult human, we do not have any pluripotent stem cells within our bodies. So, there are two types of human pluripotent stem cells. The first that you may be most familiar with is human embryonic stem cells. These are cells that are taken from the inner cell mass of a structure called a blastocyst. A blastocyst is um, the product of a fertilised egg about five days post-fertilisation. It's a mass of about 50 cells, and the inner cell mass of that is the human embryonic stem cells. Um, and excitingly, there's another class of human pluripotent stem cells that we're really interested in. And these are cells that we actually make in the lab. So we take tissue from patients, people like yourself, we take a little skin biopsy, and we grow those skin cells in the lab. 
And what we can then do, thanks to amazing science, is we can reprogram those cells back into a stem cell. And these are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPSCs. The benefit of these cells is that we can take them from healthy patients and diseased patients and compare their cells side by side. And this starts to inform us of what the causes are of disease, so we can study disease in the lab. So together these are termed human pluripotent stem cells, or HPSCs. And as I mentioned, um, once we have these, we can then differentiate these into any cell type that we're interested in, in studying in the lab. So we can make eye cells, <coughs> muscle cells, neurons, bone cells, you name it. <coughs> so here we have a video of some um, heart cells that we've made in the lab. So this is an image of some cells um, under the microscope. So these are cardiomyocytes and um, Play, but as you can see, they're beating, which is, which is what the, the heart is supposed to do. We can also make um, pluripotent stem cells into brain cells. So here we can see a, a mass of, of, of stem cells that have been differentiated into brain cells, which are called neurons. And these big, long projections that are coming out from that cell body are the axons, which, which transmit the electrical information in neurons. So obviously, at the Centre for Eye Research Australia, um, we're interested in diseases that affect the eye, and in the neuroregeneration group, we're interested in diseases that affect the retina. Um, so the retina is the uh, quite a complex structure that's located um, at the back of the eye. It is a, a tissue that's constructed of multiple different cell types that are organised in layers, and its role is to receive light signals from the outside world, convert that light into an electrical signal, and then transmit that signal to the brain to the visual cortex, where it's then converted into an image that enables us to see the world around us. So how it works is light actually, if we imagine that the, the front of the eye is at the top there, light actually travels all the way through the retina, and it's absorbed in these cells at the bottom called the retinal pigment epithelium. So pigment, um, pigmented means it can absorb the light. We know that when we wear a black shirt under the sun, we get quite warm, and that's because black absorbs light. So these cells absorb light, and then the light sensing neurons, known as the photoreceptors, are able to receive that light signal and convert it into an electrical signal, which is then able to be transmitted through these networks of neurons all the way to the retinal ganglion cells, which carry that light signal to the brain. And if any of these cells are um, diseased or dysfunctional, any, any of these cells are diseased or dysfunctional, it obviously puts a, a stop in this process of transmission of light to the brain, and that means that patients will develop the symptoms of blindness. So in the neuroregeneration group, we've been focusing on methods to differentiate stem cells into these cell types that form the retina. So we've been able to successfully um, create or differentiate um, the retinal ganglion cells, which are the cells that are affected in glaucoma. We've been able to generate photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. And these are the cells that are affected in age-related macular degeneration and also a bunch of other retinopathies. And excitingly, we're also able to create these retinal organoids, which are three-dimensional structures that contain all of these different retinal cell types in an organized manner. So if we focused first on the retinal <coughs> ganglion cells, the cells that are affected in glaucoma, as I mentioned, the, the role of these cells is to transmit that light signal from the eye all the way back to the visual cortex at the back of the head. And so they do this via super long axons. And so what we can see here is that these cells that we've differentiated in the lab have these beautiful long projections, which is what they require in order to carry that light signal to the brain. And so we use these cells to study we use these cells from healthy patients and diseased patients to start to look at what goes wrong with these cells in the diseased patients to start to inform us about what goes wrong in glaucoma and other diseases of the optic nerve. We can also make the retinal pigment epithelium, the layer at the very back of the eye. Um, and so this is the, these are the cells that are affected um, and die in age-related macular degeneration. And so this is just an image of, of what macular degeneration looks like to a sufferer. Um, where they lose central vision because the RPE in the macular region of the retina are actually dying, and this is responsible for central vision. So here at the bottom, we have a colony of stem cells, which we're able to differentiate into these pigmented cells, and to the naked eye, they're actually black, which is what they need to be in order to absorb the light, and we can see this here on, on panel A and B. 
And when they grow in the monolayer, they form a beautiful honeycomb structure, mosaic-like structure. And so we're interested in looking at these both in diseased and healthy donors to see what goes wrong with these cells in, in these diseases and other retinopathies. We're also able to make these three-dimensional retinal organoids. Um, and this has been a really exciting advancement in the last three years or so. Uh, it's a technology that really wasn't available before. It's kind of taken off and, and really boomed. Um, so what these are is, is structures, um, it is a stem cell that we then able to give the right instructions to become a, a self-organising little mini retina. And so in these structures, we have all of the different cell types that form the retina. And the beauty of this is that we're able to then look at how these cells interact in a three-dimensional system. <coughs> and it also means that we're able to isolate any cell type of interest that we want. So from here, we, we're actually able to isolate photoreceptors to study, to see what goes wrong in diseases. So obviously, all of this, this kind of work takes a lot of, of man hours. Uh, we spend a lot of time replacing the media to keep the cells happy. So the food that we give to the, to the cells has to be replenished almost daily. So we're in the lab a lot sort of uh, replenishing this. So my boss, of Associate Professor Elise Peebay, came up with the idea to replace us with a robot. <laughs> so uh, this is Pierre. He's our automated system. Uh, he um, is phenomenal. He's able to replace the mundane task that we used to have of, of changing media and enables us to, to get out into the lab and do the interesting experiments and start trying to make some, some progress in, in terms of finding out what goes wrong in disease. Oops. So um, <coughs> this is just a short video to show you um, Pierre in action. So uh, there's a robotic arm that comes in and, and takes the, the plates containing the cells, puts that down, sucks off the media, replaces it with some fresh stuff. and um, this is not only enables us to go into the lab and do interesting experiments, but it means that we can scale up the number of samples that we can look at. So we can essentially do uh, handle hundreds of patient lines at any given time because now we have a robot to do to do that mundane task for us. So that's been really exciting for, for our group. Um, if you require any more information about how stem cells are used for research, um, I can recommend these three websites. Um, I'm sure Megan might have some suggestions in her talk about uh, some other resources, but these are certainly um, three really good websites for more information. And I'd just like to thank everyone who was involved in, in all of the stem cell work at CIRA. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Um, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you a little bit about one of my passions. Luckily, Grace gave such a fantastic talk and explained stem cells to you because I'm a clinician. And for me, when I first heard about stem cells, it was the stuff of science fiction. And I'm really excited by um, what stem cells research might actually mean for this rare eye cancer um, that I'm very passionate about um, and the hope that it might bring to um, children and families in the future. So retinoblastoma is the most commonly occurring eye cancer in children where the tumours can develop at any time from even before the baby's born to around five years of age. And that's the, the timing is dictated by um, the maturity of the retinal cells when they stop dividing in the eye. It can affect one or both eyes um, and it is caused by mutations or a gene change in the RB1 gene. Now some of these mutations are what we call in your germline, so they're in every cell of the body. And when that happens, that can be inherited from a parent or it can be passed on to your children. It might arise in a child for the first time, so their parents may not have the disease, but during um, embryogenesis and cell division, the gene change or spelling mistake, if you want to call it that, occurs for the very first time. And then they would then have the ability to pass that on to their children in the future. The other thing with germline mutations is you have a lifetime risk of developing other cancers through adolescence and even into adulthood. They're higher than the population risks. The other type of retinoblastoma is what we is caused by what we call somatic mutations. So this is a gene change that occurs in the retinal cell itself once embryogenesis is completed. And when that happens, that type of disease is not inherited by a parent from the parent and it's not passed on to the children. The important thing about retinoblastoma is that for a long time the disease is confined to the eye. Okay, and this gives us a unique opportunity to treat the disease and maybe save the eye, maybe save their vision, but our main goal is to save the child's life. Now what we can see here is there's a, a classification system of disease and in some children we will have very small peripheral tumours, some children it will be a little bit larger and in others it will be quite extensive disease. Once it's outside of the eye, retinoblastoma is very aggressive and fatal. We have a number of treatments that we can use depending on what stage of disease that the child has. And they may have extensive disease in one eye and less extensive disease in the other. They may have multiple tumours in one eye and one big tumour in the other. So we decide on a, a treatment regime for each child depending on how much disease they have. The good news is retinoblastoma is actually the most survivable of all paediatric cancers in a developed country. And the question is, how did we get there? To, um, to consider the history of retinoblastoma is actually quite interesting. I've been dying for an opportunity to talk about the history of retinoblastoma. <laughs> I thought this audience might enjoy this bit, so bear with me. So in 1809, James Wardrop um, was the first to really describe retinoblastoma in a way that we are still describing it now. And he recommended the treatment as removing the eye. The problem was that uh, there was no anaesthetics. So once anaesthetics became available in the mid-1800s, then removal of the eye to treat the disease was an option. The other very important thing that happened around about the same time in 1851, Helmholtz developed or um, invented the ophthalmoscope. And that's an instrument by which we can look inside the eye to um, identify the disease in the case of retinoblastoma. So now we could treat it, we could see it when it was still in the eye. And the next perhaps crucial step was von Graef who recommended that when they remove the eye, rather than just cutting the eyeball, you've got your eyeball and the nerve extending out of the eye, rather than cutting the nerve flush with the eyeball, that perhaps we should cut as long a length of optic nerve as we possibly can. Because when he was doing this operation, he saw part of the nerve looked grey, the bit that was exiting the eye looked grey, and then it started to look a healthy pink colour. So he thought, well, I'm going to cut where it's pink. And what he was actually doing was creating a clear surgical, what we call now a clear surgical margin. Because before when they were cutting it flush with the eyeball, they were still letting 
retinoblastoma cells out and the child would still succumb to the disease. But when he started excising a long length of optic nerve, the children started surviving. Now, the next thing, in the, the early 1820s, Lurch was the first to actually describe a family of four out of seven children all with this disease. And it was at that time that they started to think, well, maybe this is a bit hereditary. And certainly, once we had more survivors because of the technological advances of the 1850s, more families emerged, affected individuals who survived went on to have children. The clever thing was, ophthalmologists of the time thought, well, you know, maybe it's a good idea if we examine these children whilst they're very young, and perhaps we can identify the disease whilst the tumours are much smaller, which they did. But in doing that, they needed a different treatment other than removing the eye, because now they were perhaps able to save the eye and maybe even save vision. So radiation came about from the late 1800s and then it was used extensively through the 30s, 40s and even 50s. We now know that radiation in the treatment of retinoblastoma is, has quite significant um, uh, side effects that is so much so that we tend not to use radiation quite as much these days. War, you'll all agree with me, war is not good. But the one thing that happens with war, you know, during war times, is a lot of medical advances actually come out of these periods in, in our history. And in World War II, when they started using nitrogen mustard, it was because what was happening was the nitrogen mustard stopped cell division. Because cancer cells divide really rapidly all the time, nitrogen, they thought, well, maybe we can use nitrogen mustard as a treatment rather than to kill them. And it was um, used by, by 1953 um, at the Wilmer Institute in the US. There was a, emerged the first reports where they used nitrogen mustard combined with radiotherapy in retinoblastoma. And they were able to um, stop the disease from developing and retain, and the individual retained quite good vision. So six or nine, so you could still drive a car with that, which is fantastic. The problem is that the majority of children, between 85 to 90 percent of children, won't have a family history of retinoblastoma. And it's a whole other talk that I would have to give. You'd have to sit here for an hour. Um, for me to talk about what we're doing about at CIRA to try and diagnose these children a little bit earlier. But for the 10 to 15% of children who do have a family history, then we're able to screen them from very early on. Um, as I said, even before birth, um, we use fetal MRI, so the mother, pregnant mother can have a fetal MRI, and we actually were the first to report uh, three, years, three years ago now, an infant who at 35 weeks in utero was identified as having disease in both eyes. And he was born the next day so we could start treating him. So quickly do these tumours um, divide and, and grow within the eye. And that was to try and save his eyes and his vision. Now children who don't have a family history of retinoblastoma, by and large, are having to have their eyes removed to treat the disease so that we can achieve that goal of saving their life. And that's because they're not presenting early enough. And as I said, that's my other research work. But children with a family history of disease, because we're screening them so quickly, so, so early and so regularly, we've only had to remove one eye out of 24 in the last 20 years. So early screening works, and the treatments that have been developed over the last, say, 70 years um, have gone uh, have, have made great gain, allowed us to make great gains in terms of saving eyes and saving vision as well. The, in terms of saving vision, we can't, the one thing we can't control, we can control when we identify the disease, but we can't control where the disease arises. And when the disease arises in that very central area of your, of your best vision, there isn't much we can do, but we can limit its um, extent. Treating children who have small tumours sounds good in theory, but it's actually a very arduous process. We can use focal therapies on very small tumours using laser or cryotherapy. And we can combine that with chemotherapy. And there's a standard um, bank of drugs that we would use that over the years, um, through trial and error, has been identified as being the best way to treat this disease. 
you would be familiar with many of the side effects of chemotherapy because it's toxic. It's toxic not just to <coughs> cancer cells, but it's toxic to healthy cells. You'd be familiar with the hair loss and infections. But in children, when they're developing and we give them certain chemotherapy agents, they also lose their hearing at a time when their language is developing. And that's quite a significant um, side effect that, that we would not find desirable, obviously. So I put it to you that with the, the, the prospect of stem cell research, maybe children with a family history of retinoblastoma are still driving new treatments. And is this a vision for the future? Mouse models, you'd be familiar perhaps that we often look to using animal models to understand disease. And as Grace very beautifully outlined, um, in a way that I could never explain, um, the fact that using stem cells, we, don't, we won't need the mouse models, we won't need the animal models anymore because we can model the actual disease in a dish. And that gives us this opportunity to then understand the disease better and perhaps try other treatments rather than testing treatments on humans. Um, I probably really don't need to go through this because Grace has certainly um, identified with, uh, and already talked to you about removing um, a small skin, skin, um, skin sample, turning it into the fibroblasts and then reprogramming it to become any cell type that we like. And so that's exactly what we've done at CIRA is um, through my association with the Children's Hospital and families and their children with retinoblastoma, I enrolled four retinoblastoma adult survivors, each with different retinoblastoma 1 gene mutations. And using this stem cell technology, we've been able to try and replicate retinoblastoma in the dish. So if we have a human model, then maybe we will understand how retinoblastoma arises a little bit better, and maybe we'll even understand more why only some people develop the second cancers. Maybe we can test different chemotherapy agents. We won't need to be testing them on the children. We actually don't have time to be testing them on children because we can't get it wrong. So maybe we won't need the three current agents we use. Maybe different combinations would be better. And then there's also the hope of gene therapy. Um, so in, t in collecting these uh, samples from the, the retinoblastoma survivors, they've been able to um, grow these stem cells and develop retinal cells, and we're starting to be able to um, induce this tumour development, the, the tumour development in the retina, and we're artificially inducing it. So then we've got something to test all these treatments on. It's a little bit like if you think... Um, when you might have a throat infection and you go to the doctor and you and we'll take a swab of the infection and they'll roll in a dish and then they'll say, oh yes, this infection requires these antibiotics rather than having to go through three or four different types of antibiotics until you're cured. So familial retinoblastoma, very rare but still informing the future for what I hope will be a, a future of promise. Maybe gene therapy is so far off the radar but we have to start somewhere. It's taken us 200 years to get this far, but I'm sure that, um, that we will get there in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was an amazing talk. Uh, another example of clinical applications that we can do with stem cell research in, in, in very young patients. Uh, so, so far now we've listened to two uh, local speakers from the Centre of Bio Research. Um, our third and last speaker is uh, an amazing inviting speaker from, from outside the, the Institute, um, Associate Professor Megan Monsi. Over the course of 20 years uh, of career in stem cell research, uh, Associate Professor Megan Monsi has combined her scientific expertise that has been gained through working in academia and the industry with a deep understanding of the issues associated with stem cell research and its clinical trans, uh, translation. She has called for numerous educational resources for the public, health and education, uh, educational professionals, contributed to the development of policy at a domestic and international level, 
she is a member of, the, of several international multidisciplinary research teams exploring impact of stem cell research and regulatory and regulatory provides advice and information to Australia patient advocacy groups and community, community members of the stem cell science and associated issues. Megan is uh, Deputy Director of the University of Melbourne Centre for stem, stem Cell Systems with the School of Biomedical Science and also is Head of the Ethics, Engagement and Policy Unit of the Australian Government Founded Stem Cells Australia Initiative. She has always been fascinated by technology and its impact on society, and in addition to her career in stem cell science, she has worked over 10 years as an embryologist in Australian IVF clinics. In 2018, this year, she was awarded the Public Service Award from the International Society for Stem Cells Research, one of the most highly regarded uh, societies in, in the world in recognition of her public outreach of, public, of policy advocacy in stem cell research and science. Please welcome Associate Professor Megan Martin. Thanks, David. I'm pretty concerned that that uh, bio is going to go for the full 10 minutes of my talk. <laughs> um, so what I want to do is now, I suppose, bring us back to what this means. So we've heard about some really fantastic research and we've heard about the, I suppose, the hope that we invest in research, but where are we at? And what do you kind of need to be aware of as you navigate a lot of these stories? So um, as my title says, I want to talk a bit about how we can kind of frame some of these developments and arm you to be informed, but also to be wise around how you gather your information and evaluate it. So uh, that's kind of how I want to kind of to, to use my um, time this morning. But I was going to ask whether anyone saw this coverage back in March. This is a, 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 a grab from the BBC website. But it, the news was everywhere. I know ABC did a lot of stories on it. And it was a story, um, and it featured, I think, even an interview from Douglas Walter, who is 86 from the UK. And it featured the story of two patients who participated in a clinical trial in the UK. And this was really exciting for us who've been working in the stem cell field for a long time because it's a culmination of all of the, the basic research we've done. Now you heard from Grace how, how Sierra's lab can make those pigmented cells, those light absorbing cells that are somehow dysfunctional in macular degeneration. So they were at the bottom of that test tube, right? So this group in the UK, who's headed up by Professor Pete Coffey, um, the, I think it's London, London the, the, he's at Moorfield Eye Hospital in London, and their project um, has been in, the, in development for, for I, I'd say, the good part of the last decade. So like what the Sierra group could do, this group knew for a long time that they could make these pigmented epithelial cells. They could make them from embryonic stem cells, so those cells isolated from an embryo, they could also make them from a patient or from a donor. But they, could, they knew they could make these cells, they could make large numbers of them. But the challenge was, could they introduce them back into the eye? And were they safe? Because these cells, although they have this incredible capacity, these pluripotent stem cells, if we coax them and give them the right signals in the lab, they can grow into nerves or heart or even bone or cartilage. But if, they, if we don't treat them right, they do whatever they like, because that's their power. So they, they have a risk of forming a tumour. So that's sort of certainly not what you'd like to do. Uh, so you might actually harm the patient. So we're very carefully progressing and harnessing the power of these cells and progressing towards the clinic. So this group was the first, I, from my perspective, the pioneers in the field. They did a lot of the work that they needed to do in the lab. They then went to animal studies and made sure that the cells appeared safe. And, and, and they then started to go to patients. So Douglas is, is one of the first two patients that was treated in this very early phase clinical trial. And as the title of this article says, the quote from him saying, I've been given back my sight. So he had vision uh, deterioration in one eye. And after this intervention, He's absolutely delighted. 
And I think this is fantastic. But I, what I wanted to caution you about is that this is the outcome from the, the first clinical study. We want to know if Douglas's vision is retained six months later, six years later. We want to make sure that those, those cells we put back don't revert back and form a tumour. And he'll need to be, be managed and monitored for a very long time. But we need to start somewhere. And so I think it's fantastic that people are willing to volunteer and participate in clinical trials. Uh, and I'll come back to that point. So great news, wonderful news, but often a little exaggerated is, is I suppose, my perspective and my concern. And if, if you're suffering from macular degeneration, you probably want to go and find out about ring Sarah and say, where is my, where is your clinical trial on macular degeneration? I want to volunteer. I want to be your guinea pig. And unfortunately, we're still at that very early stage where we're only, there's only a handful of these trials around the world. I hope that we'll have a trial here in Australia soon, but we don't at the moment. So what do you do? You've heard about the science, you've heard about the promise, you've had this diagnosis and deteriorated vision. What do you do? And unfortunately, a lot of people jump online and they search for help. And they'll find a website like this one, and uh, you probably can't read it, but I'll read a little bit of it to you. It says, Returning Hope, that's the name of the, the website. A little bit provocative and emotive for my liking. Um, bringing patients together with doctors who provide safe and effective stem cell therapies in Asia. Nothing wrong with that. We're all about connecting and networking and bringing patients together. The problem for me is that there are very few proven treatments using stem cells. What I just described for Douglas is the first sort of test case. We don't know it's going to work for everybody. We don't know it's going to work for Douglas in the long term. But these, these kind of companies are claiming success now. They actually don't even do the research. They don't even do the clinical trials. They're kind of bypassing <coughs> all of that and putting up their shingle and saying, come and see me now. And I think that's quite dangerous. <coughs> So you'll also notice on this website, down on the left-hand column, there's a whole lot of black writing that's probably too small to read. But those dot points are lists of treatments that they say they, or conditions that they say they can treat. So up the top, we've got anti-aging, diabetes, hair restoration. Um, and then it goes down to uh, uh, arthritis, brain injury, cerebral palsy, so a real A to Z list. What's missing on that, this list, which is what I often see in these clinics, is erectile dysfunction, that's another big ticket item usually at the top. Um, there are no proven treatments. When it comes to using stem cells in the clinic, and we have used stem cells in the clinic for <coughs> decades, it's really only using bone marrow stem cells, so the stem cells in your bone marrow that make red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, to help a patient make red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. So you might be familiar with someone who's had a bone marrow transplant or maybe even a cord blood transplant, leukemia, for example. They're the proven, that's a proven application. That's part of our, you know, our, our, um, our current medical um, best practice. But those stem cells, if you put them back into a patient, they can't form new cartilage. They, they're not programmed to do that. That's not what they do. Uh, so those other uses, we have to work out cleverer ways of using stem cells to kind of coax them to do the right thing at the right time. So unfortunately, from my perspective, these companies, and, and make it, I want to make it really clear, these are commercial companies who are selling these treatments, are effectively, in my eyes, selling hope. And they're almost co-opting and absorbing all this great work that people like Grace are doing in the lab, and saying, oh, we're doing that too. No, often not. We actually doubt that there's even stem cells going back into the patients. And just to be clear, the patients who are having these treatments back, it's not like they rub the stem cells on the skin, they inject them. So they inject them into the vein, and even in the, the children with cerebral palsy, for example, they'll inject them into the fluid around the spinal cord, or even directly into the brain. So these are cells that aren't prepared in a, in a really high class facility, often just some kind of back lab, you know in a, um, a, a small practice. So quite a concerning area that a lot of us have been trying to raise awareness about for a long time. Because from a community's perspective, why not? Why not have a go? Why not be a guinea pig? You know, you've got nothing to lose. Um, so the clinics often offer the same treatment 
for a whole range of conditions. Now, in Grace's talk, you saw the complexity of the retina, right? Um, you can see that if we're replacing the pigmented epithelial cells, which are the ones right down the bottom, that's very different to trying to replace those nerves that take the message or the light signal all the way to the back of the brain. You need a different strategy. But these clinics offer the same approach for all. It's like a one-stop magic shop. And you've got to ask questions. Now, as I mentioned, they don't do clinical research. They might use the rhetoric of clinical research, but they actually don't do proper studies. But what they do in lieu of having evidence from a clinical trial is that they put out patient testimonials. Now, I'm not saying that this uh, lovely child hasn't had benefit from the intervention. Uh, I don't know. But what I am questioning is that the use of a video that's very static, that was taken maybe two weeks after the intervention, is that really a true representation of how the child is two years later? So I think it can be quite manipulated, and particularly when there's a, a trade involved, and it's, it's money, you're selling and buying this product. I think it's, it's open to a bit of exploitation. So uh, selling of stem cells is big business. This is some work done by colleagues uh, in Australia and Japan where they looked at websites from all around the world uh, and they looked at stem cells who were, uh, websites that were selling stem cells. And unlike 10 years ago, it's not happening in far-flung countries with low regulation, low kind of government oversight. It's happening in countries where you think that there'd be higher standards. And so the darker the colour on this heat map, the more the clinics. So there's a little scoreboard down the bottom. The largest number of clinics offering unproven treatments are in the US. It's then India, Mexico, China, and Australia, uh, just scraping in on the scoreboard at, at, at number five, uh, with 19 clinics. Now, uh, I, I was quite horrified back in 2011. This study was done in 2016. But I've known about the trade in stem cells in Australia for um, at, at least uh, the last seven years. And in fact, we've now got about 70 clinics. About 20 of them are selling, you know, some kind of beauty product. Um, but about, about 50 are doing some kind of quite invasive treatment. There's only a handful that offer eye interventions, vision uh, restoration. Um, but for a lot of other conditions like arthritis, um, these treatments are being marketed now, and often marketed as a replacement for conventional treatment like a knee replacement. So uh, people are putting themselves at risk. And you might have been wondering as I'm speaking, why not have a go? You know, the science is promising, why not be a pioneer? Well, I'd like you to refer you to a story that's in the New York Times about three women in Florida. So these women had uh, age-related macular degeneration, so their vision, vision loss was deteriorating. They probably heard about clinical trials like that one I told you about in London. And so they wanted to have a go. They uh, still had enough vision that they could drive. But what happened was uh, at least one of the women went online and searched and went to a clinical trials registry that's actually sponsored by the US government, you think was legitimate. And, and she found a clinical trial on there. So she went to this clinic in Florida and she had a treatment. All three women had the stem cells injected into both eyes on the same day, not by an ophthalmologist or a surgeon, by the nurse, I think, in the practice. They were all left blind. And this, this is a, a photograph of one of the backs of the eye. And can you see all those black splotches, all those dark splotches? That's blood. And it's probably an indication that the retina was detached. Because of this intervention in itself. So the, the cells that were put back were actually taken from that, a lipo aspirate, zhushed on the same day and then put back in. And in this procedure, the cells haven't grown into a tumour. But it's the procedure itself that's caused ir irreparable harm. So these things do come at risk. And, and I just want to be very aware of, of, of that. So alongside all of the great science that's happening, we want you to ask questions if you are thinking about it or encouraging your friends and family to ask questions. And we have a new resource that uh, Stem Cells Australia put out with the Royal Australian, uh, Royal Australian New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists. And there's a copy at the back for you. And it's just really some helpful questions to ask and some information 
about what stem cells are, just to reinforce the things you've heard about today, what are those safety concerns, what the evidence is and what you should look out for, I suppose, and what you should be aware of. So my final slide is just to summarise uh, those warnings. And, and if you were contemplating stem cell interventions, or dare I say, any intervention that's unproven, it should be done in a clinical trial. You should try to participate in a clinical trial or, or wait till a relevant and a well-constructed clinical trial is available. Be wary if the same treatment is offered for many different conditions. We know how complex the eye is, so one, one cellular therapy is not going to fit all applications. If a clinical trial is asking you to pay for it and pay in the order of ten to $60,000 per treatment, um, I'd be thinking twice. If they're using testimonials and not peer-reviewed publications, I'd be thinking twice. What we're seeing with a lot of these clinics is they're using the patient's own cells and they're saying, kind of, well, therefore they're safe. It's not like having cells from a fetus or from a donor where there's a risk of infection or the cells growing in, a, in the wrong way. It's from you anyway, so it's just a reallocation of the cells. It's not quite as simple as that. And I don't think I've shown you just even the injection itself can cause harm. So finally, if your doctor, your, particularly your specialist, doesn't know about a treatment, I think I'd be thinking twice. It probably is, is too good to be true. So I hope you found that helpful. And as Grace said, you can visit our website and find out more. And, and at the back of this sheet, there's also a lot of other websites that you might like to visit. Thanks so much. example of how, um, how important it is to be informed about the, the clinical treatments with stem cells. So I think it's very important to, to hear me about it. Um, so we have a few min minutes for questions and we're going to have a panel uh, to ask any questions. So please pop your hand up and I'll come around with the microphone. Oh, that's not the one. <laughs> Feel free to speak loudly. <laughs> Anyone? Please at the back. Is there a microphone? Don't we? No. Um, we don't have a microphone. We, we don't have a microphone, so we we don't. We don't have a microphone, so if you can just ask your question. There's a gentleman here. Question. Uh, do you have any ideas when your trial from the lab might get into clinical trials, sort of phase one, phase two? In terms of transplantation, so, or any, any yeah, transplantation? Yeah, um, Our lab is not, we don't work on, our aim is not for transplantations at this point in time. We use um, the stem cells to model the diseases, so this means that we can create and screen for drugs. That's kind of where we're at right now. Um, generally, clinical trials can take sort of from from the discovery in the lab to a clinical trial can take anywhere from between 10 to 15 years, to my understanding. Um, and that's after you know, years of research and establishing uh, proper methods prior to that um, discovery in the lab. So. It's definitely a lengthy process, and I think um, Megan explained this really well. The, the risks are too high to make errors at clinical trial level. So much of the screening has to happen in the lab. Um, we have to test a lot of our theories in animal models just to ensure that um, the system's the same for all the patients. So it is slow. I know that it's, it's frustrating. Yeah. yeah, so um, uh, so it's a really great question, but I think we get 
all conditions of clinical trials at all. So I can, I can, I assume that we will be starting clinical trials for next generation in the next maybe five to ten years in Australia. But sometimes you don't necessarily want to be the first study as well. So uh, I want to give the example of colleagues of mine who are working in the University of, of New South Wales. So they're working on another type of blindness where the, the surface of the eye is damaged. And they've done a clinical trial where they're trying to make basically a graft. So you can make a, 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 a sheet of cells and then you cut away the damaged part of the eye and you use it like a band-aid. Now they did the first, they've done the first Australian clinical trial using that approach. And they had some success, I think, just top of my head, I think it was like the order of, I think about 60%, 60, 60 uh, Anyway, they did maybe 10 patients and six or eight who had improved vision. But they also saw some things that they were concerned about. So they've gone back to the drawing board and done a lot of lab work and are now back to another clinical trial. So when we start, to, start talking about clinical trials, we often think about it as being you know, an, an inevitable progression to the clinic and to a, a safe treatment. But sometimes we learn things in a clinical trial, first in man study, that we never envisage that make us have to go back to the lab, back to the drawing board before we want to go back into patients again. So it's this kind of iterative cycle of, of learning. So I know it's a long winded <coughs> to answer your question, but I think it's important when we talk about clinical trials, we also have an understanding of, of how it's not just a, a process, it's not just a long process, it can be a complicated process. Thank you, I think we have time for another Thank you very much. And um, uh, just also, as I start, you're using the mic for the response size time, but if you can certainly get close to the mic and so we can all hear you, it would be helpful. But I, I want to thank you, uh, the last speaker, for the warning that we get, and that's very real about the proliferation of stem cell treatments. But I want to ask you the question, which you sort of partially answered in the last response. If there's a I understood it was a treatment in more fields. Now you might correct me that it's not a treatment and it's still a trial. But don't we have a duty, you in particular and other clinicians here, to replicate that straight away here instead of waiting and waiting and waiting? I really say this as a patient. You know, I put that question to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so thanks for the question, and I, I certainly uh, completely uh, know where you're coming from and agree, and you know, I have my own different health issues myself that I grapple with. But I, I do think that it's not, it's not a treatment yet. It's not a treatment yet. It is a, still an investigation. It's still part of research and development. I do think we need to do more clinical trials here, and that's something that we're definitely trying to work out how to do that, how to fund that. So I think that, that we need to have opportunities for Australians to participate in clinical research. But, I, and, and I can see that macular generation will be the first, it should be one of the first ones we do. Uh, other more complex conditions will, will need to be longer in that kind of development of the pipeline. But you're absolutely right, we need to have, it's a hollow warning to say beware of the charlatans when there's nothing
we need to wait to see, okay, we fixed this, but in doing so, have we created another problem, but not knowing how long that other problem is going to take to make itself known. So I understand the, the frustration, and it is difficult, but we still, as clinicians and as scientists, we want to do we want to do things that will make it better, not make it better for a little bit and then make it a whole lot worse than it would be. Thank you very much. That's a great presentation. Um Megan Scripture, I uh, as well as uh, work with the Melbourne University, I run an organization called Cataract Kids Australia. And I just really um, rather than ask a question, I want to thank you for this fantastic resource um, position statement with Glenn's quote on, on the role of stem cells in treating ocular disease. Um, <coughs> many parents of children that are affected by cataracts are really desperate for an alternative treatment to surgery. And it is um, it can be very disheartening to have to say, well, we're not, we're not there yet. But um, it's great to have a really high quality resource that we can refer parents to to think about the questions that they should be asking. I'd also add, um, Megan, in addition to those kind of websites that you've outlined, um, people from clinics overseas are actually infiltrating um, online peer support groups and posing as parents or interested parties to, start to really pick, try and help people in. And so I think you know, this work is really fantastic. Thanks, Nick. And I, I'd like you to just follow on. So uh, I think Nick has raised a really interesting point, and that's the also this um, is a bit related to your question around duty of care, right? We have a duty of care, and we're we're very compassionate and want to advance the field. What I see in these clinics, because they are very well funded, because they're selling pretty expensive treatments, is that they provide an extraordinary service. They have somebody who can speak your language, answer the phone and help you. They provide a concierge service. So you're picked up at the airport and taken to the hospital. And so they make it very, very easy for you. Uh, and and I, I can see why that's also very attractive, but it's also very predatory. So I think, yeah, I, I think it's a quite a concerning practice. And we're seeing a growing number of um, examples of social media where you're actually, even before you are directly contacting a clinic, there's a way on Facebook that they can find you based on your search. So I've had examples where uh, some uh, young woman who had a terrible life-threatening condition was not even thinking about stem cells, or she was in a very peripheral sense. And yet, according to her brother, on Facebook she was sent targeted message, targeted advertising material, which changed her life. She wanted to mortgage her house and so. I'd like to know whether, um, being in my twilight years now, um, which is really racing ahead of me a little bit, but um, could I leave as an organ donation part of my eyes to be researched um, when I'm no longer here? Is that going to be of any benefit in the long run? This question can be answered by Grace. Um, I, my work, I work with donated um, eyes from, from human donors. Um, it's imperative to, to the work that we do. So we're able to maybe in some cases isolate the cells from the back of the eye, maybe culture them up and try to understand them a little bit more in the dish, which is, which is the way that, that we work as stem cell biologists and as cell biologists, we work with cells in dishes. Um, if we're able to isolate tissue and maybe study how, how that works metabolically, how it, how it responds to certain treatments. It's definitely important to the work that we do that we have people who are willing to donate their organs. Um, we treat the tissue and the organs with the respect that they deserve. We make sure that um, we use the tissue and, and the organs properly. Nothing ever goes to waste. It's all useful for uh, progressing our knowledge and improving our understanding of, of the retina, of the eye in general. So 
Absolutely. Awesome. So uh, I believe you can make a donation through the um, organ donation registry. Um, we receive our donated eyes through the Lion's Eye Donation Service. So any eyes that have their corneas removed, um, we then take the rest of the eye and, and use it for research. Um, in some cases, the cornea is not removed for reasons that the Lion's Eye Donation Service team will decide, in which case we get the entire, the entire body of the eye intact, so with the cornea um, still intact. Um, but yeah, we are, uh, week to week, we, we can have anywhere between two donors on a given day or one, one donor per month. So it kind of varies. Um, um, but yeah, it's fundamental to the work that we do. So and we, we are very grateful for the generosity of the donors. I think that donor card only says donor. It doesn't say any particular part of the body. Yes. Yes. So part of Germany. Yes, I believe, I believe that's right. I just want to add to that. Uh, I work closely with the Lions Eye Donation Service. Thank you. I work closely with the Lions Eye Donation Service who collect the eyes for cornea transplant and also for research. Um, I think if you are interested in your eyes being used for research and, and the research can go on the benefit of people, then you need to talk to your loved ones and let them know that you intend to give consent for research use. There is, this, there is one consent for donation for transplantation, and then there's a separate box to tick if you are willing to let your eyes be used for research as well. So just be sure that they understand that, uh, where to tick that box. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. One more question? Yeah. Quick one. Um, I promised my friend who was going to try and get here today that I'd ask you, she has motor neuron disease, um, all but all Z, so it's a started off affecting her head. Um, is there any interaction between you and the researchers of motor neuron disease as far as stem cells go? Thank you. So it's, a, it's a, again another great question to raise because I think it's important we talk about other applications. Uh, so some of the warnings I shared before, I really uh, have developed because of, of motor neuron disease. In fact, the woman I just spoke about was suffering from that condition. Motor neuron disease is, is, uh, it has a, 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 a tough prognosis and a very short time. So they're, uh, they're, they're people suffering from that and their family are grappling with that hell of a lot uh, in a very short period. And of course, these clinics in my mind prey on that. When you think about motor neuron disease, where stem cells have a really important role, it's a bit like what Grace was talking about with disease modeling. At the moment, we have no drug, good drugs that can halt the progression of this disease. So in this disease, the motor neurons, the neurons that control how we move, how we speak, uh, they get affected and they slowly die, or in some cases quite rapidly die. So replacing all of those is going to be really tough in the transplant. But in a dish, we can understand much more about the condition. So colleagues of mine at the Flory have been able to get some funding through, um, I'm not quite sure whether it's the Ice Bucket Challenge or one of the other fundraisers, but they're doing exactly this with robots, just like Elise. But just like Pierre, the French robot at Sierra. Yeah, you're using Pierre, actually. Oh, you're that project. Oh, cool. So we're generating all of their IPS. Yeah, So we're generating all of their IPS lines for that particular project on the robot that, that I showed you earlier. And then they will get to take them back to the Flory, which is the Neuroscience Institute, and then differentiate them into the motor neurons to do the disease model. And just to follow on to finish that story, why we want to do it is that there are different cells that are, are affected in this disease. So there's the motor neurons that obviously have a very important function that connect the brain to our limbs. But there are also cells that nurse them, keep them healthy. So my colleagues are interested in what's going on in this disease. And of course, there are different types of motor neuron disease, so they want to understand much, much more. If we have to 
expand it and we can grow it, we can test these cells, we can grow these cells in the lab, we can start adding drugs to them to see whether we can identify a new drug that can stop progression of disease. So it may well be stem cells eventually leads to a, a, a treatment to promote neuro disease, but probably won't be cells put back in a patient. It will be drugs discovered through stem cells.